Okay, let me uh, get into the sermon now. So um, this is, if you weren't here last week, this is a continuation from last week. I'm just talking about why bad things happen. So this is why bad things happen part two. And last week we just went over the different causes of what actually causes bad things to happen. Um, and you know, we talked about, you know, you can, you can inflict harm on yourself. Other people can inflict harm on other people or on you. Uh, then there is spiritual attacks as well from Satan and, and devils uh, of attacking people. And we, and we looked at the story of Job and what uh, devils and Satan is capable of. But also God as well as, as a chastisement, you know, when he, he loves his children. You know, obviously he can punish unbelievers um, on this earth and in hell. But he also punishes his children as well uh, for doing wrong, you know, and, and we even see like the story of Ananias and Sapphira when they lied about how much they gave to church. God actually took both their lives and killed them. So we ought to fear God in that sense that God's punishment, he can punish us with sickness, with weakness, with, uh, with death. Um, if, we are, if, if we want to be a rebellious child, we have to have that fear of God, uh, our loving father in heaven, that he will chastise uh, every son whom he receives. And, and this is a really important thing because if we just think God causes everything in the world and he causes all this pain and suffering, then it's almost like we're saying that God sins because if, if a woman gets raped and you say God causes that, then, you know, is God making people rape people? No, you know, we have to understand that there is free will in the world, that people have this free will, you know, angels and the devil and Satan and his minions have free will as well. And, and people with free will and, um, you know, spiritual beings with free will are able to inflict harm on one another. And it's not necessarily God causing that. Now, the logical question then after that, and then this is what I'm going to go into in this sermon, is why does God allow this, right? Because obviously, you know, God can, can stop things if he wants to. So even though he is not the direct cause of it because he has created beings with free will, you can ask the question, well, if God has the power to stop it, why doesn't he stop it? And that's what I'm going to go into, into today's sermon. Some of the reasons why God actually allows suffering, you know, why he allows suffering and why suffering um, actually makes us better. You know, if I was to just conclude it here, you know, suffering makes us better people. It makes us, it grows us, it does all these sorts of things. And we're going to look at a couple of these different factors. So let's look at the first factor I've got here. First one is suffering or when bad things happen to you, it, it, it teaches you to value life. You learn to value your life. Um, look at this verse here in Ecclesiastes 7. Uh, these verses here. It says, a, a good name is better than precious ointment. So I've just underlined the word better because I just want you to see how often it's repeated in this, these couple of verses here. A good name is better than precious ointment. So what's a good name? A good name is like your reputation, your character, what people know you to be is better than what? Precious ointment. If you think about it, that's a material possession, isn't it? So the Bible's saying here that your character, your reputation is more valuable than the things that you own, more valuable than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of one's birth. Isn't that interesting there? It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. So what is this verse talking about? What is the house of mourning? The house of mourning is when you go to a funeral, right? Where people go and they, you know, we, we, we remember the people. And that's why it's linked in with verse number one, where it talks about the reputation. Because that's what you remember when you go to somebody's funeral. You don't think about how big their house was. You don't think about how much money they had in the bank account, right? Oh, unless maybe you're, in, you're greedy and you're looking for inheritance. But... You know, you, you go there, you think about what, that, what legacy that person left. You know, how maybe they were very generous with what they had, um, their character, what the, the good things that they did in their life. Um, so this is the house of mourning. So the Bible's telling us here it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. It's better to attend a funeral, it's saying here, than it is to go and celebrate, you know, a new life even. Because, you know, when a baby's born, you know, we have like Atticus's birthday, we have baby showers, we had um, you know, Anastasia's baby shower that my wife went to. But the Bible's saying here it's, it's actually better to go somewhere where you have to mourn than go somewhere where you celebrate. Why? For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. So why is it better to go to a funeral than it is to go to necessarily a baby shower? Well, it's because 
all of us are going to die one day. All of us one day will breathe our last breath and we will leave this earth. And the Bible saying here, that happens to all men. That's where everyone goes. And it says the living will lay it to his heart. See, when you go to a funeral and you see that dead person in the coffin or you remember this dead person, what do you start reflecting on? Right? You start reflecting on, man, what am I doing with my life? You, you think and you say, one day that's going to be me in that coffin. What did I do with my life? What am I doing with the short life that I have? You know, you know, how are people going to remember me? It makes you think about your own life when you realize that that's the end that you're going to get to as well. You're going to be one day that person lying in that coffin and your life will be over. And what did you do? Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Now notice it says the heart is made better, not the heart is made happier. Because obviously if you're sad, your heart is not happy. But it's saying that when you experience sadness, your heart is made better. Why? Because gen generally it, it, it gives you some, uh, what's the word, like uh, uh, um, resilience, right? Like you get some resilience when you, when you suffer, when you go through bad times, you learn to deal with those things and you become a better person. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning but the heart of fools is in the house of feasting. So it's saying the wise person considers these things, considers why bad things happen, that you know, life uh, is short and one day we will, we will die. But the fool is like the world, right? Where they're just partying. You ask them, what do you think about what's going to happen after you die? Do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven? And they're like, oh, I don't really think about it. The Bible's saying that that person is a fool not to think about these things. And even unbelievers, when they go to a funeral, they sometimes will think about those things. And we pray for the people that are not saved. And sometimes that's what it takes for somebody. Sometimes they need to lose a loved one or they need to lose somebody that they, that they valued or they need to go to a funeral and look at that dead person in the coffin and think, man, that's going to be me one day. And maybe that now they'll start to consider spiritual things. They'll start to think, well, what happens after I die? Because why, I'm working so hard. I'm working such long hours. I'm trying to like, you know, provide for my family. But one day it's going to all be over and who's going to remember me? What's my life going to mean? Surely something is after this life. And that's the conclusion that everyone gets to. Because if it isn't, and this is what Ecclesiastes talks about, if, if it isn't, if, if all life is, is you just work your butt off and then you die and, and then you're forgotten, that was just, that was just you were just a, a blip in the radar of, of the circle of life and you're gone. The logical question to ask is, well, what's the point of my life? What's the point of all here? But that's not the truth. The truth is there is an eternity. There is a purpose to our life. What we do here on this earth matters. It'll, it'll change what happens for all, all eternity. And that's what Ecclesiastes 7 is teaching. James 4, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. So this is somebody that's talking about all the plans they have in the future, right? What they're going to do tomorrow, these great things they're going to do, these great businesses they're going to start, this great career path they're going to have, right? Whereas, you know, not what shall be on the morrow. So you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. And this person's talking about things they're going to do in the future. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So remember, we're talking about why bad things happen. Why does God allow bad things to happen to us? It helps us to learn the value of life. One is it makes us consider what are we doing with our life. Here, it makes us consider how short our life is. It says it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. I mean, think about when you're watching the kettle boil, right? And you're seeing that vapor come out of the kettle. It just, it literally does that. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And this is how the Bible is describing our life. I mean, sometimes as, as younger kids, right? You, like Simon, it's just like, oh, things are just taking so long and he's so bored. But as you get older, like us, and you get busy, you realize how quick life is going. It just keeps going and just keeps going. I'm sure those of us who are older in our years think back and think, where did my life go? You know, and I, I remember like it was yesterday that we were having Simon and we were at Lighthouse and Simon was only a couple of months old and now he's 60 years old. It's like, where did the time go? That's because life is, life is short. Life just goes. And, um, you know, when bad things happen to you, when, when suffering happens, you consider what is really important in life and how short life is. Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. 
Now, the, real, the, re, the reason why I've underlined wants to die, and I, I heard this sermon once before, but I thought it was a great point. The Bible says here that every man dies once. And you know what that means? That means you only get to live once. So what are you going to do with your life? You know, your life is short. What's the purpose of our life? Our purpose of our life is to glorify God. Are you doing that with your life? You know, what, are you, what have you done with your life? Uh, you know, what are you, what are you doing with your life? And what are you going to do with your life? Um, so that's one thing. That's one reason why God allows us to go through suffering. You know, because obviously God created Satan perfect, right? Satan was created without sin, but because he has free will, he decided to rebel against God. But then we wonder, well, if God knew that Satan was going to rebel, why did he still create him? Why does he allow him to go and wreak this, this havoc on the earth? It's because God has a, can use him for that purpose. Because the earth is a purpose, he wants us to grow. He wants us to, to learn these things. He allows Satan to do that, number one, because Satan can then punish people that are unbelievers, but also like we see in Job, he can use Satan to test his believers, right, and grow them in character. And that's what we're going to look at a bit more deeper in depth now here in this, this topic. So one, it learns us, it teaches us to value the sh very short life that we have. Number two, um, why does God let bad things happen to us is it helps us to grow in our character, Right? Like we talked about, the heart is made better. It gives us some resilience in our character. And obviously, Job is the ideal candidate when we think about that. But I just want to show you here that even though Job was perfect, well, you know how Job was perfect and an upright man, he eschewed evil, but yet he, he, he still could grow in character, couldn't he? And that's something interesting because even Jesus in Luke 2, as a man, we know Jesus was sinless, Jesus was perfect, but we see here that even part of being perfect is still growing in character. Right, because look here, it says, and Jesus, he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So isn't that interesting that Job is said to be perfect and yet God worked on a couple of things with him and Jesus is perfect and yet he increases in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and in favor with man. And that's kind of like what I touched on when I preached on the 301, you know, the mystery of godliness is not how the 301, but the mystery of godliness is how God became a man because if Jesus was God, how, and he knows everything. How is he increasing in wisdom? This is, this is a great mystery, right? How, we, how, that, how that works. So let's look at uh, Job, Job 23. Just a couple of verses here. Because see, even though Job was perfect and we saw the things that Satan did to him, why did God allow that? Because God was working on his character. God was still molding him and, and working. Like we sang, he's molding this masterpiece uh, in Job. And that's why he allows Job to go through this thing. And even though Job was perfect, as we read through Job, we start to th see that Job is breaking down a bit. Like he's not, he's not handling it as well as he was in the beginning. Um, and look at this verse in Job. This is where he's still handling it the right way, right? And he's still got the right perspective. He says, then Job answered and said, even today is my complaint bitter, right? So he's, he's still, he's, he's not taking it his best way, but he's sort of going back and forth. He's struggling with this. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, right? So now he's, he's starting to like wonder. He's like thinking like, where can I find God? I want to ask him and figure out what's actually happening. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments, right? He's saying, go to God, I'm going to order my case. I want my, he's saying, I want my day in court where I, where I can say to God, like, what did I do wrong? Um, I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. So he's saying, like, then, then he'll tell me why. Then I'll understand, and then I'll know why. You know, will he plead against me with his great power? No, right? So when he finds out what God has to say, it's not like God's just going to, Get, go down on him and be hard on him. He's going to tell him the truth. He says, but he would put strength in me. So the reason why he wants his day in court, he wants to talk to God because he knows what God is going to tell him is going to strengthen him. He's got the right perspective, right? He's not really doubting God's goodness at this point. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, um, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. So you see how Job's going through this. He wishes that he could be with God, that God would speak to him, because right now he's thinking God isn't with him. God is not there, right? And that's why he's trying to seek him out. Was Job right about that? No. Right? But he's kind of, you can see that he's kind of like struggling with this, right? But he knoweth the way that I take. And this is where the song 
of a rejoice in the Lord, right? Um, he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So you see here how he's got the right perspective that God is trying him. Why? Because God's trying to make him better. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He's saying like, I desire to hear from God even more than I desire food. Now we get to Job 31. So this is the last time Job speaks before um, you know, uh, the, the, the younger man speaks. I think it was Eliphaz or something like that. And then, Job, and then God answers in Job 38. So he says here, Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I think what he's saying here is, you know, I, I'm wishing that God would listen to me. And he's saying, even if my, one of my enemies wrote a book about me, because you know how Job was seeing himself righteous in his own eyes. He hadn't done anything wrong. He says, even if my enemy writes a book about me, I'm going to like wear that as a crown, because what can they say about me? Um, Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I would declare it unto him, the number of my steps. He's saying, I'm happy to tell God what I, what I do. As a prince, would I go near unto him? If my land cry against me, or that the furrows likewise thereof complain. So he's saying if people, right, um, you know, how he's treated people and the land, um, you know, if, they, if they would complain against me, he's saying, I'm happy to, for them to hear the case because he hasn't done, doesn't believe he's done anything wrong. If I've eaten the fruits thereof, Without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, let thistles grow instead of wheat and cockle instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. So you see how he is sort of standing his ground, saying, like, what did I do wrong? And, and sometimes we just go through suffering. We didn't necessarily do anything wrong because, you know, like I said, there are times when it's self-inflicted, but sometimes suffering is caused by other people. Sometimes it's caused by Satan. Sometimes God is just allowing things to happen to you. Not necessarily because you've done anything wrong, because he wants to teach you, he wants to grow your character. And that's what you don't want to miss. When you go through a hard time, you know, don't just charge God foolishly, you know, be like Job's wife. You need to consider and think, what is God trying to teach me in this? God, God has allowed this to happen to me for a reason. And what's the lesson that he wants me to learn. That's what the perspective that you want to have. But obviously, you know, it's easier said than done. I'm not up here saying that I always do that, but you know, it, that's all this sermon is, right? It's a reminder to all of us that this is the perspective we ought to have because even the most perfect man on the earth at the time of Job was starting to doubt that, starting to doubt that God was not with him, starting to doubt that, you know, you know, you know um, why was this happening to him? And I won't go into all this. We all know the story. God answers him, answers him a lot of questions, kind of puts him in his place, right? God doesn't actually answer to Job why he did the things that he did. And that's something interesting about the story of Job, that Job actually never gets the answer, right? Job doesn't actually never knows that, that, that the exchange between Satan and God actually happened, right? We know it. So we read the story thinking, oh, yeah, it was Satan and things like that. But Job never actually got the answer. God answered him asked a bunch of questions. Were you, where were you when I created the world? This thing, that thing, you know, there's all these questions that he goes through. He shows him Behemoth. He shows him Leviathan, right? Never actually tells him why he did all this. Just basically told him, why are you questioning me? You know, I know what's best for you. I'm God. You're not God, you know. And then Job responds. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. So you see, Job realizes this is where he had to grow, right? Where he started to question God and things like that. And he realized, you know, God sort of put him in his place. And he's like, well, you're God. You know, you know what's best. You know, I just need to know to learn to trust him. Um, Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Um, so Job's story is, is quite interesting. And it's, it's, it's really, you know, sometimes you wonder, you know, like why did God let Job go through all this? And the obvious is simple because in James 5, it tells us, it says, take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and of patience. 
So you see here the reason why Job was allowed by God to go through the things that he did is to be an example to us so that when we go through hard times, we can look back at Job's example and be comforted by that. So thank God that Job was who he was and that God allowed him to go through that because now we can read back at this book of Job, see the struggles that he went through, see the end result and be comforted in that. And this is how God uses your life too. I'm not going to turn there in, in, the, in I think it's in uh, 2 Corinthians, but talks about you, God allowing you to go through these things. This is the reason why sometimes God will allow you to go through things too. It wasn't a point in my notes. I'm just thinking about it now. But sometimes he'll use your life and he'll use the things that you go through to be a comfort to somebody else. Because think about it. How can, you, how can we comfort one another if we've never been through it ourselves? Sometimes it's hard to do that, right? If you, like, like me, I've never lost a loved one that has been really close to me. So it's hard for me to comfort somebody that is, has gone through that, right? Because I, I can sympathize with them, but I can't empathize with them. But if I go through other hardships, now I can empathize with them. I can be a comfort to them. And that comfort is almost more valuable to that person because I'm not just talking from a point of view, I've never experienced it. If you've experienced it, generally that counsel you'll listen to, right? And that's why God allows us in this church to go through different things. Because if somebody has an issue you know, with their pregnancy or somebody has an issue with their health and they have the right perspective like Job did, you, God can use you to be a great encouragement to somebody else that may not have that right perspective. But if you have, if you've learned something from that, you can counsel and encourage that person. Look at this, behold, we count them happy. I mean, sometimes that's a crazy statement. It's like, it's like you're looking at people suffering and it's like, we, we think that they enjoyed it. Like we think that they were fine. It was a good thing. It was like, oh, it's a good thing that Job went through that. But if you were Job, you probably wouldn't have enjoyed it that much. You know, behold, we count them happy, which endure, you know, because you have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. What, see, so why are we happy when we read about this struggle of Job? It's because we know how the story ends. But Job didn't know how the story ended, right? When Job was going through it, when he, when he lost everything, when he had all the boils and sickness, like he didn't know what, how it was going to end. Um, and, and, and we get to see that. We get to see that example. Okay, so we learn the value of life. Um, we grow in character. That's another reason why God may, may, let us, may let bad things happen in our life. What's another reason? It sets our hearts on eternity. It sets your heart on eternity. And, you know, this is why even for the believer, you know, some people think that believers don't go through struggles where they might think about killing themselves. I would think that, uh, you know, if you knew that after you died, you went to heaven, that would make the temptation even greater, right? Like, if, if you were an unbeliever and you didn't know what happened after you died, there's still some uncertainty if you killed yourself, you didn't know what happened. But if you're a believer and you know you're going to go to heaven, isn't that even more tempting to take your life and, and to, to do the wrong thing, right? And, and take your life and then go on to be in heaven. So a lot of people believe that, oh, you know, if you're a believer, you know, believers won't do things like murder or they won't commit suicide. That's a lie. You know, I know believers myself that have taken their life because they were betrayed by somebody, they were slandered by somebody, uh, you know, maybe their wife uh, committed adultery and they just couldn't deal with it, right? I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. Obviously, it's wrong to take a life, even if it's your own life. But my point is, you know, you can understand why a believer might do that. And it's definitely possible, right? If somebody cannot, they don't have the right perspective, maybe they're out of church, something really bad happens to them. Sometimes they just want to escape that, right? That's what people want to do. They want to get away from their problems. And sometimes they just take their own life and they know they're going to be with the Lord. But you know, that's not the right thing to do. But for us to sit here and just think, oh, a believer's not going to do that. I mean, who, who, are, who are we to, to think that? You know, you haven't gone through the things that they've gone through. So, you know, us, we, we can't just frown down and just think, oh, you know, it's impossible. It's impo if I'm saved, I'll just never commit suicide. Well, you just wait till you go through some hard things and maybe your perspective will change on that. So one, another reason why God allows us to go through hard times, bad things happen, is because it sets our heart on eternity. It makes us realize that this life is not that great, that this world is not that perfect, and it makes us think about what is in the next world. You know, what's, what's going to happen later when we get away from our pain, we get away from our sorrow, we get away from the sickness. This is one reason why God allows bad things to happen to you. Why? Because when bad things aren't happening to you, 
you forget about those things. You don't look to eternity because you're cruising, right? Everything's great. You know, everything's, everything's happy. Everything's smooth. It's not until God allows something bad to happen to you that you start even thinking about, like I said, your life, what you do with your life, what's going to happen in eternity. Look at what uh, Paul writes here in 2 Corinthians 4. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, so they're temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So you see here he's saying our light affliction. I just underline that because it's interesting that he calls it light affliction here. And if you think about the things that Paul went through, right, the, 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 you know, the persecutions, the beatings, you know, he, he talks about the stripes that he received and he, sometimes he didn't have a place to sleep and he was shipwrecked in Acts. And yet all these things that happen, he looks back at it and says, it's our light affliction, right? So it makes you think if his affliction is light affliction, I don't know what mine is. Mine's like no affliction, right? So... He goes through all these hard times, but with the right perspective, right, when he's thinking on things of eternity, he can say, yeah, it's our light affliction. Why? Because it's but for a moment, right? Because our life is a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. So even if you're going through hard times, it's a, it's a light affliction because it's only temporary, right? It's, it's, and, and if you deal with it the right way, it's going to work for you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So you're going to be rewarded for dealing with it the right way for all eternity. That's, that's even better, isn't it? And why? Because you're going to look at the things that are not seen, right? Because the things that are seen, the things you can see are temporary. It's the things that are not seen that are eternal. And that's why you know, salvation is not seen, because salvation is eternal as well. Can't lose it. Romans 8, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. It's talking about the curse, right? You know, uh, you know we're all cursed. I mean, any of us who have a body, you know, start to feel this curse, right, in this, in this world. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. So it's not just the whole world. You know, it's us that are saved as well. We, we have the Spirit within us. But even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Right? So even we, when you go through suffering, when you go through sickness, when you realize your body is cursed by sin and it's got these problems, those bad things that happen to you set your heart on the things that are not seen. Right? That one day we are going to be redeemed, we're going to be given a new body, our body is going to be rede redeemed, right? We're going to be given a new body that's perfect. For we are saved by hope, but, what? but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why, do, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we, that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So you see how we, we are with patience. You remember we talked about the patience of Job. So patience is not how we think of it, right? Where patience is just patiently waiting for something. Patience in the Bible is when you're going through hard times and you're suffering it patiently, right? Like the patience of Job. So we with patience wait for it. We go through these bad times looking to uh, our redemption. And even Paul talks about this in Philippians 1. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So you see, even Paul realized that when he leaves this earth, that's going to be gain for him, not a loss. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. He's talking about the suffering and the trials he's going through, right? Because he's, he's in the flesh, he's living for God, he's being persecuted. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. So he's saying, well, I'm not really sure which one is better, right? Because I'm in a straight betwixt two. So he's saying, I'm, I'm in a, like this, like a hard and a rock place, like a, a rock and a hard place, like we would say. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's saying here, I would rather go on and, and leave this world of suffering to be with Jesus Christ, but he, re he recognizes that God has a purpose for him. God has a plan for him. God has works for him to do that it's more needful for him to be here. And all of us have that. You know, God has, all, he has those works that he has ordained for us to do in our life. We read in Ephesians 2. And that's the reason why we're all still here. Because if God didn't have a reason for you to be here, he would have just taken you home when you got saved. But the reason why you're still alive is like Paul said, it's more needful for you to be here, even though we desire to depart and be with Christ. Now, what you want to think about is what does God want you to do? Why is it needful for you to be here? And are you neglecting that responsibility? Are you neglecting the responsibility you have to serve God on this earth while you are here? Because it's needful for somebody else. 
So you may not realize this, but the, the way you live your Christian life may it, it, it will affect. You know, I, I may. I guess I. I'm not seeing it from. I, I'm. I don't see it from God's point of view. But if we do see it from God's point of view, we know that our life can affect somebody else's spiritual life. We know our prayers affect uh, uh, our prayers affect somebody else's spiritual life. But our own life, right? Our own works will as well. Um, and if we don't, um, it has a negative effect. You know, it's like the whole scattering and gathering, right? And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing, rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. All right, let's go to the, to the fourth one now. So he sets your heart on eternity. The next one is it makes you more fruitful. Now, I've underlined more fruitful because bad things don't all, always automatically just make you fruitful. It makes you more fruitful. Why? Because in John 15, it says here, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Right? Now, he, ta he taketh away could mean several things. It doesn't mean that you'll lose your salvation. You can't lose salvation. But it could mean that you get out of church. It could mean that God will take your life and you'll leave this earth. Right? But sometimes the branches that don't bear fruit get taken away. Right? This is why I say that sometimes bad things help you to be more fruitful because it's every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So what is the Bible talking about when it says he purges it? If you think about a tree, often people that take care of fruit trees or whatnot will sometimes purge the branches of excess leaves, right? And I guess, you know, I mean, obviously a tree is not a, like, alive like a person is, but you can think about that. That's doing a bit of damage to that branch. But the overall effect is that that branch will be more fruitful because less of the leaves will be taking that nutrition and it will be going into the fruit. And our life is a bit like that, right? Sometimes God has to purge our life because our life has a lot of leaves in it. And sometimes the leaves get overgrown. And there's nothing wrong with leaves, right? You can't have a fruit tree that has no leaves, right? You need to have a few leaves on the fruit tree to absorb the sun. So if you think about this analogy, like sometimes in our life, we need a bit of refresh and relaxation, right? We need to recover and recoup. Um, we need a bit of those things. It's a healthy part of life. But the problem is, is when you're just all leaves and no fruit, right? God doesn't want a tree like that. He doesn't want a tree that's just all leaves, all pleasure for yourself, all thinking about myself, not thinking about the fruit that you can bring forth for God. God doesn't want that tree. And that's why sometimes he takes away that branch, right? But if he sees a branch bearing fruit, trying to bear fruit, he's going to purge that branch. And sometimes that purging comes in the form of bad things, comes in the form of suffering. But why does God allow that? That's what we're talking about today. It's because he wants to purge that so it'll bring forth more fruit. All right, what's another one? Another one is why does God allow you to uh, go through suffering, go through bad times? Because it conforms you into the image of Jesus. And we can see these are just different examples of how God makes us better through these things. But I want to show you here, and we talked about Job, how Job was perfect, yet he had things to learn. And when I touched on that, I talked about Jesus even as a man, even though he was perfect, increased in wisdom and in stature. But look at this here. We see that suffering was a necessary part of Jesus' perfection. He says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Isn't that interesting there? We talk about suffering making us better. And even Jesus as a man, part of the plan of him becoming perfect, right? It's kind of like when he went baptized, when he got baptized, right? He said, sort of suffer it to be so now for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. It's almost like he had to come here. He had to suffer because that's part of being perfect. It's, like, it's almost like he wouldn't have been perfect if he didn't suffer. You know, I'm not saying he's not perfect. I'm just saying like, you know, it's, it's just one of those things because he's both, right? He's man and God. So as man, he had to learn, but that's not saying he doesn't know everything. And just, I'm not saying he's not perfect just because he had to go through suffering to become perfect. As a man, he had to go through that. He had to learn, he had to grow, he had to become perfect through suffering. Um, Romans, uh, Romans 8, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. This is one of those great verses um, that I'm always reminded of whenever we go through hard times, whenever things don't happen the way we ought them, 
the way we want them to happen, that if we love God and we, we keep wanting to please him, we know that it's going to work together for good. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, God works all things to good. He wants you to go through suffering because he wants you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. He wants you to be like Jesus Christ on the earth and one day we'll get that body and we will be perfect like Jesus Christ was. Look at this in Philippians 3. It says, And be found in him, in, in Jesus, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, so it's salvation is not by works, it's not by turning from our sins and keeping the commandments, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And look at this that I may know him. You know, we always talk about knowing Jesus. You know, people say, no Jesus, no life. No, Je no Jesus, no, no life, right? Which is, which is not entirely true, right? Because, you know, to know Jesus takes a bit more than just faith. It's like, you, you know, it talks about here to know him. So it says that I may know him, and we're all like, oh, that's great. I want to know God, right? I want to know about him. I want to know Jesus Christ. But look, and the power of his resurrection. Hey, that's a positive as well. I want to know Jesus. I want to know the power of his resurrection. But look at this next one, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now that's not one we rejoice over, right? We're not thinking, I want to know God. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. That's not something that we, that we seek, right? But this is part of knowing God. This is part of knowing Jesus. You know Jesus because you know the power of his resurrection, right? Which is salvation and the fellowship of his suffering, which is the suffering that he's given to you on the behalf of Christ. The suffering that you have to go through as a believer in Jesus Christ, so that you can be conformed to his image, being made conformable unto his death. Now, I've just got some other practical examples. I've just sort of wrote these down. I just wanted to sort of read them out to you. Um, but one, for example, I, I, I'll just read this list out. This is an undesired outcome to teach you patience. Um, other things that might happen to you. A broken promise to teach you to only depend on God. Um, maybe a disappointment to teach you unconditional love, you know? Because sometimes somebody that you respect and love might disappoint you, and then you learn, hey, I need to love people um, even though they've done that to me. A mistake to teach you how to do it correctly. You know, they always say, like, there was a Thomas Edison, you know, when he failed so many times, and he says, I, I, didn't, I didn't fail that many times, I just figured out how many times not to do it, right? So it teaches us, right, how to do things correctly when we make a mistake, or, you know, a failure to teach you how to succeed. Um, Sometimes it's an un uncontrollable situation and it teaches you what? It teaches you how to pray, right? Sometimes, sometimes we, in our life, we're so focused on the path before us, sometimes God needs to bring us down to our knees until we're willing to look up, right? So sometimes God will allow bad things to happen to you to remind you to pray because you'll go through a situation that you can't control and you have no choice but to pray. Um, Sometimes it's a failure to teach you consistency, right? In season and out Maybe the reason why you're failing is because you're not being consistent. Um, it might be a loss in your life to teach you priorities. It may be a trial to teach you how to comfort others. We sort of talked about that. Um, and for the unbeliever, you know, to make them rethink their beliefs. I just want to go through one more scripture with you. I just thought this was really interesting because it's a really familiar story to us in Mark 6. But I, I wanted to just show you this one thing in this verse that you may not have seen before. So this story, and we'll read it through together, is about when they're toiling on the sea, if you remember, and then Jesus walks out to them on the water and, and goes into the ship. So we'll read in Mark 6 here. He says, In straight way he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he, sent away the pe while he sent away the people, right? So he's just sort of preached to them. He gets them to go into a ship and then they go and cross the, um, to Bethsaida. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. So he's got his disciples to go into a ship to cross this sea. And then he's gone into a mountain to pray on his own. And when even was come, so when the night time was come, it was, so it's dark, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. Right, so you're getting the scene there. The ship is in the sea and he's on the land. Now this is what I want you to see that you may not have seen before. I just think it's interesting. And he saw them toiling in rowing. Right, he saw them toiling in rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. 
For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked to them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up in, unto the, them in the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Now what I wanted to point out here is, I just think it's interesting that Jesus was in the mountain watching them toiling. Because I'm sure, like when we think about in the story of Job, you know, Job started to question where God was. Right? Remember he's saying, he's not you know, forward, he's not back, he's not on my left, he's not on my right. Um, he started to doubt that God was with him, even though we know the Bible says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jesus said, I'm with you even unto the end of the world. Amen. Right? But when we go through bad times, we doubt that God is there, don't we? And I'm sure the disciples, when they're struggling on this sea, right, they're, they're toiling with the ship, they're probably thinking, I, like, I, if Jesus was here with us, Right, because remember, they, Jesus sent them off. He went into a mountain to pray. They're probably thinking, if Jesus was here with us, you know, he, he would be able to get us out of this trouble, right? And it's not only till he comes, you know, and they thought it was a spirit, and he says, "Be of good cheer, it is I." They think, ah, oh. now they think, oh, Jesus is here, you know, and the storm calms. But what's interesting, we actually see it from you know from the Holy Ghost's point of view, in the sense that the Holy Ghost is authoring this book, and we learn here that Jesus. You don't actually read this, I think, in the Matthew account. But we see here in this account where they're going over the river that Jesus is actually watching them the whole time. Isn't that interesting? That they were toiling in there. In the other account, it just says he went to the mountain to pray. But what we learn here in Mark 6 is that Jesus was always there. Jesus was there in the mountain. He was watching them toiling. But we see here that he allowed them to go through that, maybe because he wanted to teach them just like he wants to teach us. That we think sometimes God is not there but he's always there. He's always there watching us, seeing how we're going to react. Are we going to respond the right way? He's trying to teach us something. But he eventually came for them, right? He eventually came and calmed the sea. And I just thought that was a, a really interesting point, that God had not left them on their own on that sea. He was in the mountain watching them struggle um, and letting them go through that. Um, so what's the conclusion? So, you know, God's will um, is that we would suffer bad things. We talked about the causes. We talked about why God allows these things. It's his will um, that, he, he, that we go through this suffering. And not all suffering is necessarily caused by God, but we see that God allows suffering, right? Because it makes us more like Christ. We learn to value life. We grow in our character. We, it sets our heart on eternity. It makes us more fruitful. You know, it teaches us to pray. It conforms us into the image of Jesus. And we had all these other practical examples. Uh, and, and one thing I hope you take away from this all is, you know, when you go through hard times, Jesus is always with you, even though sometimes uh, you may not realize it. All right, so I hope you learned something there today. I hope it was a uh, sort of a comforting and an encouraging sermon to you. Um, let's pray and then we'll sing uh, one last song. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you, Lord, that you're a God of all comfort and uh, that he, you comfort us through all our tribulations. And Lord, um, you know, none of us can say that we've, you know, strived unto blood. You know, we have not had to risk our life to serve you, to believe on you, as many people around the world are. God, you've given us so much freedom, so much liberty. I pray, Lord, that we would use that to serve you, because um, to whom much is given, much shall be required. We thank you, Lord, for the love that we have from you, and Lord, that we would share that love with others, and Lord, that the things that we struggle with, that Lord, that you would help us to use that to comfort others. We pray um, these things in Jesus' name. Amen.